The Water of Life, A Tale of Brothers Grimm. There was once a king who had fallen ill, and no one believed he would live. He had three sons who were very sad about it. They went down into the palace garden and wept. There they met an old man who asked about the cause of their sadness. They told him their father was so ill he would most certainly die, for nothing seemed to cure him. Then the old man said, I know one more remedy, that is the water of life. If he drinks it, he will become well again, but it is quite hard to find. The eldest son begged to be allowed to search for the water of life, for that alone could save his father. No, said the king, the danger of the journey is too great, I would rather die. But he begged so long that finally the king consented. The prince thought in his heart, if I bring back the water of life, I shall be loved best by my father and shall inherit the kingdom. And so he set out. When he had gone a little distance, a dwarf stood in the road and called to him, saying, "'Where are you off to so fast, my lord?' "'Silly shrimp,' said the prince haughtily. "'It has nothing to do with you.' And he rode on. But the dwarf had grown angry and wished an evil wish on him. Soon after this, the prince entered a ravine, and the further he rode, the closer the mountains drew together, and at last the road became so narrow he could not advance a step further. It was impossible either to turn his horse or to dismount from the saddle. He was shut in there as if in a prison. The sick king waited long and patiently for him, but he did not return. Then the second son said, Father, let me go forth and seek the water of life. If my brother is dead, he thought the kingdom will fall to me. At first the king would not allow him to go either, but at last he yielded so that the prince set out on the same road his brother had taken. There he soon met the dwarf, who stopped him to ask where he was going in such a hurry. Little shrimp, said the prince, that has nothing to do with you, and on he rode without looking back. But the dwarf bewitched him, and he, like his brother, rode into a ravine and could go neither backward nor forward, and so it goes with haughty people. As the second son also remained away, the youngest begged to be allowed to find the water of life. At last the king was obliged to let him go. He set off along the same road his brothers had taken. When he met the dwarf and the latter asked him where he was going in such a hurry, the third son stopped and explained, I am seeking the water of life, for my father is sick unto death. Do you know where it is to be found? asked the dwarf. No, answered the prince. As you have borne yourself politely and not rudely like your false brothers, I will give you the information and tell you how you may obtain the water of life. It springs from a fountain in the courtyard of an enchanted castle, but you will not be able to make your way to it if I do not give you an iron wand and two small loaves of bread. Strike three times with the wand on the iron door of the castle, and it shall spring open. Inside lie two lions with gaping jaws, but if you throw a loaf to each of them, they shall be quieted. Then hurry to get some of the water of the life before the clock strikes twelve, or else the door will shut again, and you will be imprisoned. The prince thanked him, took the wand and bread, and set out on his way. When he arrived, everything was as the dwarf had said. The door sprang open at the third stroke of the wand, and when he had appeased the lions with the bread, he entered the castle and came to a large and splendid hall. There sat some enchanted princes, whose rings he removed from their fingers. A sword and loaf of bread were lying there, which he took also. Then he entered a chamber and found there a beautiful maiden who rejoiced when she saw him, kissed him, and told him that he had set her free. She told him that he should have the whole of her kingdom, and that if he would return in a year, their wedding would be celebrated. She also told him where the spring of the water of life was, and that he was to hurry up and get some of it before the clock struck twelve. Then he went on and finally entered a room where there was a freshly made bed. Because he was so weary, he wanted to rest himself a while, so he lay down and fell asleep. When he awoke, the clock was striking a quarter to twelve. He sprang up in fear, ran to the spring, drew some water in a cup which stood near, and hurried away. But just as he was passing through the iron door, the clock struck twelve, and the door fell closed with such violence it sliced off part of his heel. But he, rejoicing at having found the water of life, hurried homeward and again passed the dwarf. When the latter saw the sword and loaf, he said, With these you have won great wealth. With the sword you can slay whole armies, and the bread will never come to an end. But the prince would not return home without his brothers, and he begged, Dear dwarf, tell me where my two brothers are. They went out before I did in search of the water of life, and have not yet returned. They are imprisoned between two mountains, said the dwarf. I have condemned them to stay there, because they are so haughty. Then the prince begged until the dwarf finally released them, but only after he had warned the prince, saying, Beware of them, for they have bad hearts. The prince rejoiced when his brothers came and told them how he had found the water of life and brought a cup full with him, and he had rescued a beautiful princess who was to marry in a year's time, and he would obtain a great kingdom. Then they rode on together. After a while they came to a land where war and famine reigned, and the king was certain the whole kingdom would perish, for the poverty was so terrible. The prince gave him the loaf of bread with which he fed and satisfied the whole of his kingdom, and he gave him the sword also with which he conquered his enemies. Now he could live in peace and plenty. The prince then took back his loaf and sword, and the three brothers rode on. After this they entered who more countries where war and famine reigned, and each time the prince gave his loaf and his sword to the kings. He had by that time saved three kingdoms. After that they went on board a ship and sailed across the sea. During the voyage the two eldest sons grumbled between themselves and said, Our youngest brother has found the water of life, and not we. For that our father will give him the kingdom, which belongs rightfully to us, and he shall rob us of all our fortune. 
so they began to seek revenge for their imaginary ills and plotted with each other to destroy him. They waited until they found him fast asleep. Then they poured out the water of life from his cup and took it for themselves, but into his cup they poured salty water from the sea. Now when they arrived home, the youngest son took his cup of water to the sick king in order for him to drink and be cured. But the king had barely tasted the salty sea water, and he became even sicker than before. Just as the king was about to give up all hope, in walked the two eldest brothers, saying to the king, We have brought you the true water of life. No sooner had the king tasted it than he felt his sickness leave him. He became as strong and healthy as a young man. Then the brothers told their father that the youngest prince had tried to poison him. The first two brothers went to the youngest and mocked him, saying, You have certainly found the water of life, but you have had the pain and we the gain. You should have been cleverer and kept your eyes open. We took it from you while you slept at sea. And when the year is over, one of us will go and marry the beautiful princess. But beware you do not tell any of this to our father, because he does not trust you now. And if you say a single word, you shall lose your life as well. Only if you keep silent will we allow you to live. The old king was angry with his youngest son, thinking he had plotted against his life. So he summoned the court together and had the sentence passed on his son that he should be secretly shot. One day, when the prince was riding out to hunt, suspecting no evil, the king's huntsmen were told to go with him, and when they were quite alone in the forest, to fall upon him. But when they were deep in the forest and quite alone, the huntsman looked so sorrowful that the prince asked, Dear huntsman, whatever is bothering you? The huntsman said, I cannot tell you, and yet I must. To which the prince answered, Tell me frankly what is wrong, I shall forgive you. Alas, said the huntsman, I am to shoot you dead, and the king has ordered me to do it. The prince was shocked, but said, Dear huntsman, let me live. I will give you my royal garments, and you give me your common ones in return, and everyone will think you have indeed shot me dead. The huntsman said, I will willingly do that. Really, I would not have been able to shoot you. Then they exchanged clothes, and the huntsman returned home, while the prince went further into the forest. After a time, three wagons of gold and precious stones came to the king for his youngest son, which were sent by the three kings who had slain their enemies with the prince's sword and fed their people with his bread, and now wished to show their gratitude with their extravagant gifts. The old king then thought to himself, Can it be my son was innocent? To his people he said, Oh, if only he were still alive! How terrible that I ordered him to be killed! Your majesty, said the huntsman, he still lives. I could not find it in my heart to carry out your command. And he told the king what had happened. Then a stone fell from the king's heart, and he had it announced in every country that his son might return from his wanderings and come home to his father again. In the meantime, the princess in the enchanted castle had a road made up to the door of her palace, which was quite bright and golden. And she told her men that whoever came riding straight along it to her would be the right man and might be allowed to enter. Whoever rode on one side of the road was not the right one at all, and not to enter. As the time was now close for the wedding celebration, the eldest son thought he would go to the princess and pretend he was her rescuer. Thus he would win her for his bride and her kingdom to boot. So he set out on his horse, and when he arrived close to the palace and saw the splendid golden road, he thought, it would be a sin and shame if I were to ride over that. So he turned aside and rode on the right side of it. When he came to the door, the servants told him he was not the right man, and to go away. Soon after this, the second prince set out, and when he came to the golden road and his horse had put one foot on it, he thought it would be a shame and a sin if I broke a piece of it off, so he turned aside and rode on the left side of it. But when he came to the door, the servants told him he was not the right one either, and to go away. When at last the year was over, the third son rode through the forest to his beloved, leaving his troubles behind him. He set out and thought of her so incessantly, and wished to be with her so much, he never even noticed the golden road. His horse rode upward the middle of it, and when he came to the door it was opened, and the princess received him with joy, and she claimed him her hero and lord of the kingdom, and their wedding was celebrated with great rejoicing. When it was over, she told him that his father, the old king, had forgiven him and invited him to come back again. So he rode back and told his father how his brothers had betrayed him as he slept at sea, and how all the same he had kept silent. The old king wished to punish them, but they had gone to sea, and they never came back as long as they lived. The end.